Welcome back to Worthy Effort Woodworking. As today we are going to be talking about chucks, all the variations and jaws you can get for them, and the tenons and recesses that we use to hold our work. Along the way, hopefully I will give you some tips on buying ideas, different options you have, different techniques for making both the tenons and recesses, and reasons why you might want to make one versus the other in certain situations. So come along and let's make a mess. Now I want to start off and tell you, you do not need a chuck to wood turn. If you're just getting into wood turning, you bought your first lathe that came with a drive center and live center so that you can turn between centers by squeezing the work in, you can accomplish just about everything. That kind of work holding and woodworking dates back to well before the Egyptian age because we know that one because there's actually pictures on the pyramid walls of people wood turning in that very manner. And they've made bowls, boxes, all that kind of stuff all the way back then. Chucks are somewhat of a modern day invention that we kind of stole the idea from metal woodworkers. Uh, though most of the time they use a three jaw chuck and we use a four jaw chuck. And these are called scroll chucks because there's some kind of mechanism on the inside that allows all four pieces of our wood turning chucks we use four jaws to move in and out equally so that we can squeeze down on something and keep it centered. And that ability opens up so much flexibility, ease of grip and stuff like that, that I'm going to contradict myself and say that getting a chuck is almost a mandatory man mandatory in this modern era for no other reason in that this is how we teach woodworking nowadays. You don't see too many people other than maybe uh, spring pole turners uh, that kind of stuff that are teaching the techniques for bowls and boxes of using just spindle drives or actually nails which are somewhat like face plates for holding woodwork. A chuck just opens up so much possibilities for learning techniques on your own because you can follow the instructions in books and magazines and YouTube videos and symposiums and most teachers out there are going to teach it using a chuck. So, while it's not necessary, in today's day and age, it is somewhat necessary. Now, which chucks to get is always a question I get asked and my standard sp uh, response is get either a one-way or a Vic mark. Now there are a lot of manufacturers out there right now, but you gotta understand, I live very, very frugally. I am a cheap man. And even I will tell you, this is something you wanna splurge on. Get the best, get the top tier. Buy the Bugatti and, Fer and Ferrari of the Chuck world because they will last you generations. And that's been proven by the past generation of wood turners that just got into this because Vic Mark and One Way have been around long enough that pros have truly abused them and those pros are saying hey we're still using those original chucks that I bought uh, whereas a lot of the alternatives out there uh, they might be good they might be not you might be get a good one in a batch you might get a lemon but for some reason, they are less money, and these things take a lot of abuse. And time and time again, you see it on forums and stuff like that, where they will buy one of these alternative brands, and then in a few, they say they're great and wonderful, and then in a few years, they're swapping them out for a one-way or a Vic mark, just because they loosen up something, something shifts, and they're just not working as well. And plus, these have been out long enough that if you are trying to save money, you can get them on the used market. Uh, all of these right here, I bought on the used market. So they've had a lot of abuse to them. Now I'm going to tell you, the demonstration I'm going to show you today is uh, going to be on one-way chucks. Just because I went down that camp road and all my accessories work across the board with these one-way chucks that I have. It's kind of once you go in one family, you're probably going to stick with it and they're good enough quality, you'll be there for a long time. Now, as an example of the mechanics of a, of a chuck, I'm going to use this one way. Now, it's kind of confusing. One way is a company. 
It is also a model name of one of their models of Chucks. They have their small model, which is called the One Way. Then they have a mid-sized model, which they call a Talon. And then they have their monster one, which is called a Stronghold. And basically it comes down to size, the capacity that they you can hand hold stuff into, and uh, the mass. Um, if you're turning a lot of big bowls, obviously I would get a bigger chuck because it can just take a lot more pressure. But then again, I've turned some of the big bowls on my lathe, the six, I have a 16 inch lathe of that size, just fine with this one. It just all depends upon what kind of jaws you get on to attach to your chuck, and I will cover those in a second. Now, most chucks are going to have a way to attach it to the lathe. All the chucks I buy have an adapter that goes on them. So I, if I ever change my lathe to get another brand or something like that, my chuck can go with me. In fact, this has gone to, with me to, through two different lathes. You just buy a different adapter that has different threads or sizing right here. You can buy some chucks that are threaded a specific way and then buy, you know, something that screws into that that then will screws into your lathe but the more you do those kind of adapters it kind of diminishes the capacity of your chuck plus you're farther and farther away from those bearings on your headstock so in my opinion it's probably torquing on those a little bit more just wearing your lathe out a little bit more so just get one that goes right with it these are not much money and when I say they're not much money if a top tier chuck was a hundred bucks more than the next level down I would still say invest in the top tier chucks but generally I did some research right before I came here and the price difference is only 20 to 40 dollars if you're comparing apples to apples over a lifetime that is nothing plus the fact that you can, if anything does wear out or loosen up or something like that all these parts they've been around so long that you can buy parts for them fairly inexpensively Though I've never had to really do anything to all the chucks I, I use, and frankly, I kind of abuse them. Now, when you get a chuck, you're also going to want to get some jaws, and they attach to your chucks, generally with screws and stuff like that. Though if you will notice this one way, these have these slots right here. They call those a safety slot, and one of the, the jaws is going to have this little pin. And what that does is it prevents you from moving the chuck back and forth back and forth too far as it will limit its travel somewhat a bit now a lot of chucks will advertise a long travel but you really shouldn't need too much of a travel you just need to be able to grip the tenon and you size the tenon for the jaws that you're using these right here are probably the most common size they're in number three then they, uh, excuse me, they're a number two, and then you can get a number three and a number four in these steel styles. And the number fours are pretty much the biggest ones that I, I have any use for. And I, I don't see too many people getting bigger. If you go bigger than this, then you're using uh, face plates or other kind of stuff. You can also buy physically larger chucks, like number fives and stuff and they call these like jumbo jaws or something like that and they, they're made of aluminum and they're meant to squeeze the outside of a bowl and I will talk about their peculiarities in a second but they are not for heavy work they are just that last little bit for like removing a tenon or a recess then you're going to find a lot of specialty jaws, long spigot jaws or all the kind of stuff it seems every year or something there's a new fad and jaw chuck designs but for the most part if you are just making bowls boxes and stuff like that just get the standard kind of jaws now there are several different options when you get jaws these that you show right here are what they call serrated and profiled what that means is the inside of this is very parallel it's not dovetailed at all and you have these serrations on both the inside and on this outside lip can you see that I never know in the video okay well a jaw is designed to be able to either squeeze on a tenon or expand into a recess the serrations you basically fit into whatever size you want and because they're 
these little triangles, they will kind of compress the fibers a little bit and give you a lot of traction so it will grip it quite a bit coming out. And the way they design these serrations, they actually pull it in a little bit because the strength of any kind of joint, whether a recess or a tenon, is not necessarily how far deep the tenon goes, but the contact with the shoulder of this chuck right here. That is where all your strength comes from. So if it's able to squeeze it in a little bit, you'll gain a little bit more strength. The other size is uh, what they call dovetailed or smooth ones. And you can see the shape of it is slightly dovetailed so that if you put a dovetail in there, it will slide down and squeeze against the shoulder once again. If you expand into the recess, it will um, once again squeeze it down. The other thing you need to consider in this is whether or not your jaws are going to be profiled. And you can get some that are uh, unprofiled or not. Now when they make a set of jaws, they actually make it out of a solid blank so that they are all going to be very concentric. And then they saw them apart. So in order to get the perfect circle, you actually do have to have a little bit of space in between them. If you cinch your jaws together, notice that is not a perfect circle. In fact, if you were to put a circle in there, it would be touching on these four spots and it could slip because it doesn't have the ultimate grip. The ideal size of any set of jaws is going to be the exact space that they separated out that exact circle because you will get contact all the way across. Now, if you have your jaws a little bit of farther apart, basically the circle is going to be contacting here, 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 and here. And it will actually pinch into the wood quite a bit. A lot of people get frustrated in that they might put something on one set of uh, uh, a tenon then they reverse a piece and it doesn't it's not perfectly centered anymore that's because perhaps these are compressing a little bit different rate on different spots of the wood because wood is not a homogeneous medium it is not consistent if you're pinching in sapwood here and heartwood there obviously that's going to go into the wood a little bit more and this is offsetting your piece a little bit one way or the other but i want you to think about something else here what if I were to put in a square block, which is something I commonly do in my chucks. That square piece is going to be contacting on these eight points alone. That isn't that, that much strength, and those points are really going to compress into the wood. So when they make something that they call profiled, they're talking about this design right here. And notice now, whenever I spread it apart, well, notice, see how these, because they are now flat, they're going to be contacting that square quite a bit. In fact, that's how I do all of my, uh, my uh, tops, is I leave the blank square, and notice all the contact that you're getting on the outside. If you only had these right here, it would only be pinching on the points. So if you're going to be doing a lot of chucking up square stock, Granted, there is no wiggle room here. If you get a bad catch with this one, you're going to get a bad, bad catch because this will continue turning. The downside of this profile is that if you do do a lot of perfectly sized round tenons, well, you're not going to get as much contact with this design as you would um, with this style design if it's a slightly not perfect shape because now you're just contacting on these interior points of the circle, not these exterior points. And with this design, they are, those contact points are spread out a lot farther so they will give you more torque, so to speak. It's a secure hold on irregularly sized tenons. Well, I can see some of y'all saying, well, why would that be a big deal? You should be turning your tenons to the optimum size for not only function, but safety. You want your chucks to work at their best. That really isn't always an option, especially if you're a bowl turner who twice or thrice turns stuff. Because you get a green piece of wood, you turn it perfectly round, get the nice shape, thick shape, but evenly there, and you stick it up to dry, within weeks it's going to warp. 
Here's an example. I have this bowl. It was turned in 2014, and when it came off the lathe, it was completely flat in a perfect circle. It is not a perfect circle now. Neither is the tenon on it. So whenever I rechuck this up to return it to get the shape I want, I've got to return this tenon in order to get it to fit into the chuck. Now, if I had sized it perfectly from the get-go, when I return it, it's now going to be too small and I won't be able to put it on the chuck. So on green wood, a lot of times you want to turn them a, quite a bit bigger to compensate for any future warp. Plus the fact that I find that these edges right here, green wood will actually compress a lot easier than fully dried wood. So if you have these corners biting into an oversized tenon, well then I can get a better bite because these will actually compress into the wood, that tenon a tad bit more than if it was perfectly sized and just squeezing it. And when you're rough turning stuff, you're going to get some vibration. You're going to be hitting, you know, square corners. You're turning a lot of air. So you're boom, 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 boom. You're compacting it. So every few minutes or so, you're always retightening your chuck a little bit, allowing that to bite in a little bit more. And after it gets a little bit of compression going on, it just doesn't seem to need to be retightened as much. Whereas if you had it perfectly sized, you would still be getting that compression, but you're going to be constantly retightening a lot more often than if you were just getting those spikes from the corners in there because it's not squeezing those fibers as much. And remember, it, fibers are only going to squeeze so far, then they'll really start pushing back. This doesn't seem to hold it as well, but then after the fact that whenever it shrinks a little bit more, it'll never go back into that chuck where if it was oversized, I could turn it down a little bit and it will fit in there just perfectly. And that is the reason why I kind of have acquired these dovetailed, straight, non-profiled, large bolt ones because whenever I turn bowls, I tend to get the biggest logs I can and then core them out. And this gives me a little bit better bite into that green wood. And I typically use these smaller serrated styles for boxes and stuff like that because a lot of times that's already either kiln dried or stuff that's I've dried here that I'm not having to twice or thrice turn. It's going straight to whatever shape I, I have so that I don't have to deal with that compression as much. And it's that compression in green wood why I prefer using a tenon as opposed to a recess when I'm roughing out the bowls, or at least that first monster size one, I like having that big tenon on it. And that kind of comes to when do you use tenons and when do you use recesses? A lot of it comes down to grain direction. You see, most of us when we are, um, right, you see most of us, you know, you get a tree, we cut up the tree, into our sections. If we are doing ingrain bowls or something like ingrain boxes, which most boxes are turned in crane, we are basically taking that tree, turning it on its side, and spinning it around its axis. And in that situation, the only thing you can do is use a tenon because a tree is very weak going along the grain. If you've ever seen a person splitting firewood, they stick it up on side. The axe hits it, it just kind of explodes apart. It's very strong going across grain, very weak going with the grain. Well, if you have a recess in a piece of wood, which is spreading it apart like that, and the grain is running this way because you turn the tree on its side and rotating around the axis, it is going to want to split it right down that center, right along those grain passes, because that's the weakest aspect. But if you had it in a tenon, you're basically compressing the fibers so the block of wood with the grain running this way would not split. But a bowl turner, or at least most bowl turners, we don't turn the tree on its side rotating around the axis. 
we basically take that tree just like that and we return turn it end over end. So the weakness of the grain is now running this way, right along where that tenon is. And I have had bowls break off that tenon. And it only occurs when I'm being stupid. When I'm turning a monster bowl with a very small tenon because I have too small of jaws on there. Which is why I had those big jaws. So I can put a much bigger tenon there so there are more fibers holding the wood onto the blank. And I will say this. This has only happened to me on green wood. Green wood splits a lot easier. So when you're roughing those out, that's when that happens. But on green wood, a lot of people advocate on the monster size bowl, if you're coring out the centers, on the biggest one to use a recess. Because with a recess, you're coming in here, you have all of this fiber on both sides to combat the wood splitting. And even though you're pressing it out, it's not in a splitting force so much. Whereas if you have the tenon, you only have this much of whatever you are resisting the splitting action. Now, why don't I do that one as my preferred method for the largest green bowls I turn? Because of a complete lack of ability and pure ignorance on my part as I'm turning the wood. Because I do not have what they call feeler gauges or something like that that would tell me the wall thickness. I use my eyes to determine it in my fingers. And time, nice little hole there. Nice little hole there. Notice a recess. Nice little hole. Hole. Holes. Time and time again, I blew out the bottoms of, my, of the bowls that I use when I'm doing a recess on them. And understand, this is my inability. Because if I have a tenon on a bowl, well, I can sight down my interior bowl design. I can use my, feel, my fingers to feel when the wood's separating. And I can get the nice bottom of a bowl shape. And when I'm done, I simply flip the bowl and I turn off the tenon. And many times you can put a little bead on there if you want a foot. Or if you don't want a foot, you can actually turn it off and put a slightest of concave underneath there so that it's sitting on the ends. I just find that a lot easier. But I'm sure some of y'all can see the problem. If you have a recess and you're doing the same technique where you're feeling it, well, all of a sudden you have to get the bottom of the bowl a lot thicker in order to not blow it out. And it makes it a little bit heavier in my mind. And in turning it, the curves don't quite match with me. I prefer to have a little bit thicker up top just so it gives you a very visual rim. And then once I come down, I'm using my fingers to determine where. Once again, it's my technique why I keep blowing out the bottoms of a recessed bowl. But there are times when you just have to do a recess on a bowl to make it work or a platter. An example is this blank right here. Now, I did it did get a little bit too dry for me, so I'm going to have to split this and make smaller stuff out of that. But if I wanted to turn a nice 12-inch plate out of this, if I were to turn off all that material to put a tenon on it, it would be worthless. There's no, there's not enough wood left. And if you are buying stuff like 8 quarter or 10 quarter wood from a uh, hardwood dealer, you are dealing with thinner stock. So, if you have a 2-inch thick piece of wood that you want to make, make a nice platter out of and you put a tenon on it. Now you go in a quarter inch. It doesn't have to be a huge tenon. Remember it's all in the shoulder, the, the tightness of the shoulder. But you now lost that much wood. So you just can't make as nice a shape. And then after all of that, so you come in, you make a nice little platter. Well, you're now going to have to recess this a little bit more, too, so that your platter will fit, sit flat 
on these two low points. Whereas if you started out with a recess, you come in that same quarter inch for the recess, all of a sudden you can turn a much more voluminous plate or platter. Maybe you do some kind of OG where it reverses, like that. And it can come down almost all the way to that recess on the shape. And a lot of times what I will do when I'm done with it is I will reverse it. And the center of the recess, you don't have to have flat. You can do a dome there so that I can take off those those corners and make the underside part of the entire design. So when you're doing long grain work, a lot of times a recess will make sense. Now there's one piece of conventional wisdom that's never really kind of sat well with me and I don't understand the physics of it. And it's for this reason. Remember earlier when I told you that people kind of tell you to use a recess when you're doing large green bowls because of all that contact patch, it's less likely for the wood to split. Well, here's the thing. You have two different styles of jaws. You have the smooth kind of dovetailed one so that they will fit up in there and as you expand it out, it's going to sink it back down. And then you have the serrated kind which are parallel but they have a little bit of a rim on the side that's going to compress those fibers to prevent it from pulling out. So, you basically have to do both of these you can turn them ever so slightly smaller. You turn the recess in that position where the jaws are together so that that diameter or that circumference right there will fit either the expansion of the dovetails or that little serration. So it can slide into the hole and then expand out on the inside as it gets to the optimal setting, which is, you know, just a little, a, a saw curve separated. Well, if you're doing that with green and you know that it's going to shrink a little bit, it doesn't give you as much wiggle room to resize that hole whenever you have to rechuck it up. Because, you know, trees don't necessarily shrink in height as much, but they shrink in width quite a bit. So it's going to be the whole the whole diameter It'll fit, the, the chuck will fit in perfectly, but then whenever it shrinks down this way, you're going to have to turn away that excess a little bit. So in effect, you make actually will be making that recess a little bit too big. And when you do that one, you, when you make a recess too big, it's no longer touching all along the rim, the outside. It's only touching somewhat in the center because the curve of each one of those is less and obviously I'm exaggerating here. So it just seems to me if you have to oversize that recess it's never going to work as well. But that kind of makes sense when if you're using recesses for platters and stuff like that because for the most part in platters you're taking wood that has been dimensioned to you know eight quarter or ten quarter and dried first and then doing it. So you're not having to twice turn stuff. It's this twice turn aspect where I get confused because people tell you on large stuff to use a recess, but when you turn it again, the recess isn't going to be as efficient. And totally disagree with me on this. And in the comments below, leave your reasoning why. Just don't come call me an idiot. Tell me why I'm an idiot. And a few last things I want to talk about. When you're using these dovetail style jaws, you kind of want to get that dovetail angle just right, both the inside and the outside, whether you're doing a recess or a tenon. And a trick I did, I've learned, my dad taught me this one, is go buy yourself a very cheap scraper because you're not going to be using it for a lot of stuff and actually cut that angle. Use your grinding wheel or something like that and get that angle just right so that when you insert it in straight, you can bring it over for the recess and get the perfect shape of your dovetail. The angle is dead on perfect. And you can do the same thing to the outside, but I find the outside a little bit easier because if I 
cut it a little bit narrow, it's going to squeeze and crush those fibers a little bit and it'll still lock it in. But it's those recesses where you just got to get the angle right. And a scraper sized to your jaws sure does make life a lot easier. Now those are the main jaws you're going to be using, but there are some accessories that go with a lot of these. Coming back to these jumbo jaw sets, and how they work is they actually squeeze down on a bowl, or if you have something that is a like a vase, you can squeeze out a little bit. But you have to be very careful with these. Jumbo jaws operate off the idea that they are squeezing down on the bowl and these rubber stoppers will kind of compress a little bit to give it some traction so that bowl will not pop off. And this is a very precarious traction. You do not want to take off huge amounts of material with this one. It's really tiny, tiny cuts just to remove, remove what was ever on the bottom of the bowl, whether cleaning up the recess or totally removing that tenon. Because what I have found is this angle right here, whenever you stick a bowl up there, you have to get the rim of whatever you're doing up underneath this angle. So that that corner right there will really compress and hopefully you will slightly touch right there and it will press it against the face plate. What happens is if you have any kind of like rim or something like that where this is more straight, well it's not dovetailed in and there's a lot, there's a good chance it will pop out. When I have those kind of situations, I make sure that when I have the bowl and I'm turning away the tenon, turning away the tenon, I have my cone of my tailstock in there and I will turn away all this stuff right here, but I will leave that cone to remove with a knife, a chisel, and a little bit of sandpaper. I do not take away that tailstock. Whereas if I'm doing anything else with another style rim that's going to fit up underneath that rubber stopper, I will remove the majority of it and for that last little cone I will remove the tailstock and just smooth it out. So when you're using these jumbo jaws just be careful. I've had more bowls come out of the jumbo jaws than any th other thing out there. Luckily at this stage they're all pretty uh, pretty lightweight. Plus the fact at this stage you know that will sometimes pop up. <laughs> I didn't find out I had it this thin until I was I had it up there and I was going to turn up, reshape this recess and then I showed on Instagram the end result. Now some other quick things about these jaws. A lot of times they go on my lathe and they never come off. Uh, I, that's why I like this stronghold. It just goes on in there. And it doesn't mean I can no longer turn between centers or stuff like that because these will hold a lot more things other than uh, just tenons and recesses. Uh, one side note, I don't know if this is spreading falsehoods or what, but I'm told that whenever you put your jaws in there, put the screws in, but leave them fairly loose um, right now, and then tighten it up ever so slightly so that they cinch together. And then you might need to play around with them to get them perfectly in that circle. And at that point in time, tighten them all up. Because I'm told that that gets, makes sure that they are locked dead center. Otherwise, one might be ever so slightly off. And it's not necessarily the jaws that might get slightly off. It's the positioning of the scrolling mechanism. Now, that might be total BS. I'm not sure, but... I've gotten in the habit of doing that one, so I do it now. But the thing about, you know, once you get into one brand of chucks, even if you have multiple lays and multiple chucks, they will interact with the accessories that go with them. For example, I am constantly placing in a live center into both of these, and it'll work with all the one-way chucks. And it's got little gaps in here, so it will just fit in there very nicely. So if you want to use a screw drive, you can. 
and it will sink on in there. Now if you're using a screw drive, I do recommend using the biggest jaws you got for the simple reason that, once again, the strength of the, screw, the jaws is the contact with the rim. So if you had a screw draw sinking it in, sinking it into that shoulder, if it's a narrow shoulder, it doesn't have as much strength as a wide shoulder. That wide shoulder just has a lot more surface area, and any rocking will give a lot more force. So if you're using screw draws, make sure you use the largest. If you're using a screw thread, make sure you use the largest jaws you have that will work with the size of blank you have, wood blank you have. And you can also do something similar with your drive spur, but you don't really have to worry about the shoulder there because it's just going to protrude along the side and then you tur turn it between centers. I love this setup because many times when I have a log, I will start between drive centers, between centers, I will round it out, I will turn the tin in, and then I can take this out and put the tin in in here without having to re remove the chuck. In fact, this chuck right here pretty much lives on my 16 inch lathe. Well I hope I was able to convey to you the advantages of using a chuck in the specifics of things like jaws and stuff like that. It all comes down to physics and dealing with grain direction. Very common theme in woodworking. Well I hope you enjoyed this video and if you did please do me a favor like, favorite, subscribe, do all those social medias, visit my website wortheffort.com where I have a lot of t-shirt swags and stuff like that and also information about patronizing me in different ways. And after all said and done, I want you to remember one last thing. That it is always worth the effort to learn, create stuff, and share it with others. Y'all be safe and have fun.